we want to continue our uh, Brahma talk. Uh, today, uh, this may be our last Brahma talk uh, in this retreat. And I, as I mentioned yesterday, I had to sum up uh, the things that I have already uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, I want to uh, point out how we uh, use this uh, entire discourse in our practice. <coughs> anyway, uh, when we uh, have uh, senses and sensory objects come in contact, there uh, arises uh, some of these uh, fetters, one or another, or all of them at uh, perhaps uh, one time or another, one after the other. Uh, so then, then we had to recognize this, uh, them as uh, fetters. Uh, the way to recognize them is that uh, we become aware of the fact that they repeat again and again and again in our mind. Recognizing the fact uh, uh, fetters is one thing and uh, once we recognize them, what should we do with them? Then there has to be a way to deal with them. Uh, the way to deal with them is the same discourse, the practice of uh, mindfulness. Now we have uh, factors of enlightenment, for instance. Number one is uh, enlightenment factor of uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness itself becomes a factor of enlightenment. That means when we keep practicing uh, uh, mindfulness over and over and over again, we will come to know now my now my mind is uh, uh, well conditioned well prepared uh, in the practice of mindfulness that means my mindfulness is good uh, I have mindfulness. When I uh, sit, uh, stand, walk, eat, drink, talk, and observe silence, I can see my mindfulness is always present. Only then we realize now the mindfulness factor of enlightenment is in me. We have seen uh, various things here in this. Uh, discourse, uh, we become mindful of, of our breath, uh, our feelings, uh, perceptions, uh, thoughts, uh, consciousness, uh, various uh, mental states. Uh, we see uh, rising and falling, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and so forth. We see them all the time. Any time we become uh, conscious, any time we come across an object, experience, we are mindful. We know this is impermanent. And then we realize now I have mindfulness factor of enlightenment. Then whenever we reflect uh, whenever we um, sort of uh, 
do stock taking, looking at our mind, then we realize, well, I have not been very mindful. I have done so many unmindful things so many times. Therefore, my mindfulness factor of enlightenment is not yet perfect, not yet ready. Then we recognize it. Then we have to de keep doing it, do keep practicing mindfulness factor again. Keep practicing, 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 practicing. This is not the question of repeat, uh, repeating the list. Mindfulness, I know, uh, factor of enlightenment of mindfulness and uh, uh, investigation, uh, effort and so forth. We are not just repeating lists. Most of the time, medit mindful meditators, insight meditators, or vipassana meditators, so to say, are very good in memorizing lists. They say, I have now udayabhyanyana, uh, I have now bhanganyana, I have now adhinavanyana, I have now this, 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 this jnana. They have memorized uh, 19 jnanas, 18 jnanas, 20 jnanas, 9 jnanas all kind of knowledge they memorize. And they say, I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this. And even then, even, even uh, sometimes in uh, uh, discussions, people simply ask questions about various jnanas, various enlightenment stages. All they do is they have memorized a whole list from Vishuddhi Magga or from commentaries or from teachers and something like that. Enlightenment factor of, uh, um, what do you call this, factors of enlightenment are not like that, to memorize and repeat. Here again, we uh, remember uh, the Pachatang Veditabha. Ehipasika, uh, Opanaika, the qualities of the Dhamma, then we ask, uh, uh, do I have this knowledge of investigation, what do you call this, mindfulness of, uh, mindfulness? And when it is not there, then we keep repeating. That is called investigation factor of, my, uh, what do you call, enlightenment factor of investigation. Even looking at the mind to see whether we have mindfulness or not is a factor of uh, investigation of Dhamma. That means we investigate our own mind, investigate our own mental state, ask the question, do I have mindfulness? Asking this question is investigation. Second factor of enlightenment. When we, f when we see the first factor is not ready, we keep repeating it by asking the question again and again. Every time we ask the question whether I have it, what we do is we practice mindfulness of investigation, investigation factor of enlightenment. When we do the investigation factor of enlightenment, if the mindfulness is not ready, we arouse our energy to investigate more and be more mindful. That is how we will have uh, energy factor of enlightenment. When we have, when we keep practicing energy factor of enlightenment, what we do, we, we uh, practice the fourfold uh, effort. We make fourfold effort. Uh, my mindfulness is not strong. I have a lot of unmindful states. So let me cultivate mindfulness effort. Then we start arousing mindfulness and we keep cultivating it and maintain it. That becomes the enlightenment factor of energy, energy factor of enlightenment. When we make more and more energy, uh, or arouse our energy, make more and more effort, 
then mindfulness becomes strong, investigation becomes strong and we have endless energy only in the practice of Dhamma, not just nervous energy, not hypertension. Uh, that is not the kind of energy we are talking about in the spiritual practice. We have a practice, we have, we have an energy to do the practice without uh, getting, without losing interest. And when, when we do that, more and more energy we apply, we become more and more mindful, we will be uh, we will investigate them and we see the Dhamma more clearly and then joy arises. The fact of joy and enlightenment fact of joy. When the enlightenment fact of joy arises, uh, we don't get excited, agitated. We will become tranquil, calm, peaceful. When peaceful factor of enlightenment arises, that is called tranquility, pasaddi, then there arises uh, concentration. When the concentration factor of enlightenment arises, mind becomes equanimous. These are the only steps on the, the, the uh, uh, what you call factors that arise in that order. Other factors don't arise in that order. First factor arising in our mind would be mindfulness. And then others follow. When we do that, uh, when uh, mindfulness factor of equanimity arises, you know, that is the time we have to, uh, we can see almost uh, it is natural for us to look into the no Four Noble Truths. Why? Because when we are, when we are uh, emotionally imbalanced, equanimity factor of enlightenment is the factor where mind, uh, the emotions are balanced. Mind are in a, a very a neutral or equanimous uh, position. It doesn't uh, become, uh, doesn't go to any extremes. And then with that state of mind, we can understand suffering exactly as it is. We look at the suffering. Uh, when we look at uh, suffering, we can understand how it happens, its cause, and how, when the cause eliminates, we uh, become liberated, and then we will see the way how to liberate the steps, noble eightfold path. Now that is the uh, that is how it is arranged. Now, when we try to practice. Uh, this is very neatly arranged when we think about it, it is, it is very neat. As I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, when we sit to meditate, we are not going through this whole discourse like this. May, we may start with, um, with breathing, because we have to start from somewhere. We sit down and start with breathing. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, thought uh, of uh, 
greed arises. Then we can see, is this greed, then we, we can either become, uh, we become, become mindful of greed, and then uh, we can start uh, looking at the greed, whether it is uh, uh, a sort of a hindrance or a fetter. How can we see that? If the greed fades away as soon as we pay attention to it, uh, then we see it's simply a hindrance for this practice. And it moves away because we, we uh, see the uh, greed is a very uh, unpleasant, painful, uh, it uh, obstructs our um, progress. And then we cultivate uh, the thought of letting go of greed. When we cultivate the thought of letting go of greed, what do we cultivate? One of the factors of enlightenment, one of the, one of the uh, what you call path of noble eightfold, one of the steps of the noble eightfold path. What step of the noble eightfold path we practice at that time? Thought of renunciation, samma sankappa. We see greed, seeing greed as it is, is seeing the second noble truth. We can see the greed as a cause of our pain. When greed arises, there is uh, disappointment, there is a pain, because uh, we know uh, that uh, greedy things we cannot get. At that moment, the greed arises. That very moment, we become very uh, mind become very uh, uncomfortable, uh, sort of uptight, rigid, uh, or become restless. We want to get what uh, the the greed uh, asks us to get. That is why it is called greed is the cause of pain. Or, uh, we, we are greedy for something which is not permanent, something impermanent, we try to clutch to that, hold on to it. That is the nature of greed. Even if we go, got it, we feel, we know that it disappears, it changes. So, we can see the way how greed creates pain. So, we can see the connection between greed uh, and the suffering. That means the first noble truth and the second noble truth. And then we cultivate deliberately, cultivate the thought of letting go of this greed at that moment. cultivating uh, right, one of the three right thoughts. The three right thoughts are the thoughts of generosity, thought of friendliness, thought of compassion. We deliberately cultivate the thought of generosity when the greed arises. Generosity means letting go of greed. Generosity doesn't normally is not normally inter interpreted that way. Generosity means uh, sharing what you have, giving away your material things. The real generosity is the thought of letting go of attachment. That is the real generosity. The generosity doesn't mean anything if you give something with greed in your mind. 
expecting something in return, and so forth. Through a real uh, uh, generosity is the thought of letting go of greed. This is <laughs> so much, uh, uh, so many things to say about it, because in the noble, noble eightfold path has two levels: mundane noble eightfold path and supramundane noble eightfold path. Mundane noble eightfold path is practicing generosity uh, in the, man, the right thought of uh, thought in the mundane noble eightfold path is practicing generosity, sharing our things, helping others, and uh, so forth. Supramundane thought of generosity or supramundane generosity is that is letting go of underlying tendency of generosity. That means you don't have any desire when you share something with somebody. You even let go of that underlying tendency. Now we are working towards that when the thought of greed arises in our mind, by cultivating the thought of generosity, we let go of, thought of that thought at that time, so that eventually one day, we would be able to let go of that thought forever, by the attainment of the third stage of sainthood. Anyway, uh, when we sit in meditation, greed arises, then we re realize that greed is the cause of suffering. And then we cultivate uh, knowing this greed is the cause of suffering, is knowing the, the second steps of the no Four Noble Truth, second truth. Then we cultivate the thought of generosity, that is the practice of uh, right thought, that is the step of the Noble Eightfold Path, the second uh, step of the Noble Eightfold Path. And suppose the hatred arises in our mind during meditation, we cultivate the opposite of hatred, that is loving friendliness. That is the second of the right thought of the Noble Eightfold Path. Or we can, there can arise a thought of cruelty to hurt somebody to say something to hurt someone, that thought can arise in the mind during meditation. So we cultivate the thought of uh, compassion, non-cruelty. Then <coughs> there, we suppose we got rid of that, and we keep practicing, coming back to our breath, and then all of a sudden. Uh, uh, we, re, we uh, experience um, uh, restlessness and worry. Then we recognize restlessness and worry is either hindrance or a fetter. And then we cultivate the opposite of restlessness and worry at that moment, cultivate concentration, pra uh, practice something uh, to tranquil the mind, thinking of peaceful object, the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and so forth, to calm the mind. Then we at that moment we cultivate uh, enlightenment factor of uh, tranquility. So, once we know the whole picture of the the four foundations of mindfulness, we can see whenever we practice, whatever happens to the mind, we use the right method, right technique, right aspect of the noble, uh, four, no, four foundations of mindfulness, the noble eightfold path, to uh, develop the positive side to overcome the negative side. So that for this, uh, we need a lot of uh, 
understanding of the entire four foundations of mindfulness. I simply wanted to mention this right now for you to think the way how we practice the four foundations of mindfulness. What we are doing uh, uh, normally is uh, focusing mind on the breath, the feeling, perception, thoughts and so forth to see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness of them. But this uh, will not be total uh, practice and the mindfulness factor of enlightenment will not be perfect until we understand the entire system through our own practice. By reading the text, the discourse, we get some theoretical understanding and when we start, when we go on practicing, we can see all these factors, all these uh, dhamma taught in the discourse uh, becoming a tool for us to deal with whatever happens in our meditation on the cushion or outside the cushion. So, with this I like to uh, conclude this, uh, this thing showing at the end of the discourse Buddha said uh, very, Buddha gave a guarantee. Right? He said, uh, if somebody uh, practices this uh, four foundations of mindfulness, entire uh, instructions, all instructions given in there exactly as they are given, not in that particular order, but the method given there we must use. The method given in the discourse is that this body, this mind, these perceptions, these thoughts exist for us to gain knowledge and awareness not to cling to them. That is the chorus. Every at the end of every passage, it is it is atika yoti va apna sati pachu patita hoti ya o dev jnana matta ya pati sati matta ya anisito chivirita na chakin jilo ki upadhyati. Ati vedana ati va apna sati pachu patita hoti. Ati chitta ati va apna sati pachu patita hoti. Ati dhamma ati va apna sati pachu patita hoti and so forth. At the end of every passage, Buddha repeated this. That means, this body, these feelings, these states of consciousness, these dhammas exist for us not to cling to, but to gain knowledge and awareness of the truth of impermanence unsatisfactoriness and selflessness. Not to cling to. <coughs> there is a uh, discourse to uh, support this in Majjhiminikaya, Sabbhasava Sutta, Sutta number 2, where Buddha said, Kullupa mahang bhikke dhammang desi emi nittaranathaya no ghanathaya. Because I teach this dhamma, for you to use like a raft. This Dhamma is like a raft. What is the use of raft? Raft is used to cross a body of water, not to cling to it. Then he said, uh, uh, even the Dhamma no matter how lofty it is, we should not cling to Dhamma. But we must use the Dhamma. 
clinging is one thing, using is another. When you make a raft to cross a body of water, you don't hug the ra raft and stay there. You just use it using your hands and legs uh, to float on the raft, or, uh, on the water, in the raft, and cross the body. Similarly, this body is the raft. This body is the raft. And this raft must be used to cross the body of suffering, ocean of suffering. Uh, Sangsara Dukkha. So, the entire sutta we have to study very carefully, very mindfully, and this is the message we get in the sutta. So, that is why he said, if somebody very diligently practice this sutta exactly in the way it is explained and use the body and mind, thoughts, perceptions, feelings and so forth and become aware of they aware of the fact that they exist for us to cross this ocean of suffering. And that is why Buddha said, if, you, if somebody practices this diligently, for seven days one can attain either full enlightenment or partial enlightenment. <laughs> that is that uh, at, attain at least the third level of enlightenment. Now, since is, it appears to be very lofty goal, I like to uh, make it a uh, uh, little e uh, uh, accessible to anybody by suggesting that you try to attain, uh, try, uh, try to attain at least one of the four stages. All you have to do this is very important thing to remember. Now, you, have, you can see here, as one enters into the first stage, stream entry path, one naturally begins and continues to practice the super mundane noble eightfold path through applying understanding, mindfulness and effort, the fetters are gradually removed in stages, culminating in full enlightenment aranthut. Now fetters, in order to get rid of them, we have to practice the noble eightfold path which is given at the end of the discourse. First, we got to understand the entire discourse as it is. We got to understand them happening in us, sanditika, that is seeing them within ourselves. Dhamma we must see in ourselves. And we must invite ourselves to come and see Dhamma. <laughs> Don't invite somebody else. That means go inside, inside the Dhamma, um, in ourselves. Uh, and you got to be very mindful, very wise to understand. That is why Pachatang Vetabhu Vinyuhi. Vinyu means wise person. 
you become wise when you are mindful. So when you practice mindfulness, you see the Dhamma in you. Pachyattang Vyattabhu Vinyohi. Each and every person. I cannot show you Dhamma. I cannot experience Dhamma for you. You go to experience Dhamma by yourself. I can bring the horse to the water, but I cannot make him drink and taste. You got to drink and taste. So, when you look at yourself with equanimous state of mind, without any bias and prejudice, you see Dhamma very clearly. And then, once you understand Dhamma very clearly, uh, you speak you think clearly, you speak clearly, and you act clearly, you choose right, unblameable job, and you practice mindfulness, you will gain concentration. Then you will see all the one of these three fetters you can eliminate very easily. For instance, uh, Somebody, one of them, according to the person, personality, temperaments, understanding, intellectual uh, ability, you know, spiritual faculties, and paramis, and so forth, there are m v many variety of things to uh, make the person's understanding different from person to person. Uh, so, given all these variable factors, one one day one uh, one of you may be able to overcome either belief in permanent self or skeptical doubt or attainment uh, attachment to rules and rituals say for instance uh, mm, somebody uh, Sees, sees the Dhamma very clearly. To see the, the futility of rules and rituals, attachment to rules and rituals, one must see Dhamma very clearly. That is the remedy. No matter how long you practice rules and uh, rites and rituals, you will never get rid of them unless you understand the Dhamma. Only way to understand the Dhamma is to practice mindfulness and concentration. When you see, when you uh, see the Dhamma, then you realize this, gee, this uh, uh, puja, that uh, ritual, and this worship, and that, don't make any sense. I must get rid of my defilements. So, that is the only way to attain liberation. You will realize that. The moment you realize that you will give up the belief in right atta attachment to rules and rituals, it will vanish from your mind. You cannot do, you cannot, you know, pull it out from your mind. It vanishes completely from your mind. The moment that vanishes, you enter the Supra mundane noble eightfold path, eightfold noble eightfold path. The moment that uh, this one of them, not only this, any one of these three, vanishes from your mind. That moment, your mind enters into the supra mundane noble eightfold path. That means. Noble Eightfold Path from that point onward becomes supramundane. So it becomes supramundane for you because the one of these three factors disappeared from your mind. Along with that, you enter the stream entry. That is called attaining at entering in stream entry. That means you re this vanishes from your mind, then the noble eightfold path becomes uh, 
supramundane for you and then your mind is supramundane path. So you go on practicing noble eightfold path again and again and again. Then you will overcome one of these other, uh, one of the other remaining fetters, maybe skeptical doubt. Doubt with regard to the past, present, future, the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, morality, and so forth. That doubt will completely vanish from your mind. And still you are in the supramundane path, noble eightfold, following supramundane noble eightfold path and stream entry path. Then your belief in permanent self will disappear because you will see impermanence of everything you experience in your life. Only by seeing impermanence of everything in your life the belief of permanent self will disappear. No other way. When that disappears, you enter the stream entry fruition stage. So, a stream entry has two stages one is a stream entry path, other is a stream entry fruition. The moment all these, all, all, all three are eradicated, you enter the stream entry fruition. So, a stream entry path and fruition are two completely separate, different stages separated by time. Separated by time, not one single thought moment. You practice, so once you enter the supramundane, what you call stream entry path, you enter and keep practicing noble eightfold path again and again and again. Then you overcome another fetter and keep practicing noble eightfold path again and again, then one more fetter will disappear, then you will be in the stream entry fruition stage. So, what I suggest is try to get rid of one of these, do not try to get rid of all of them at once, only one. When one of them disappears, you are bound to follow the path, bound to attain the fruition stage because once one of these disappears, you are, you definitely will follow the path more diligently because you began to taste the Dhamma. When one of them disappears, you taste the Dhamma through Dhamma in a deep way with mindfulness, with understanding because the Noble Eightfold Path becomes so crystal clear to you, then nobody can change your mind. You never say, well, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> it will never happen to you. And therefore, try to get rid of one of these then you will never die without attaining the stream entry fruition. Try to die with the stream entry fruition. Then what happens to you? You are no longer subject to birth in a lower world. That is a guarantee. <laughs> Second, will attain Nibbana in no more than seven births. Third guarantee has an unshakable faith in the Buddha Dhamma, Sangha and perfect, you have perfect morality. Because your doubt disappeared, so you have faith in the Buddha Dhamma, Sangha and morality. And still you continue to follow the Noble Eightfold Path. Practice mindfulness, investigation of Dhamma, uh, 
effort, joy, tranquility, concentration and equanimity, seven factors of enlightenment, noble eightfold path, keep practicing, 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 then you overcome gross part of, uh, uh, you eliminate, you know, a gross part eliminated, sensuous craving and will will. You know, sensuous craving is <coughs> when you enter the, the second level of supramundane attainment, that is what is called one straightness path. You overcome gross part of craving, one of these two, either craving or ill will. Craving, the part you overcome, gross part means you are physically, verbally, you lose interest, lose interest of cultivating, engaging in sensuous craving. Or you will be, uh, this is one of them. So, when you may, when uh, sensuous desire or craving, one of them is weakened, the gross part of it is weakened. Subtle part still there, but the gross part is weakened. You enter the once returners path stage. Moment, moment the gross part of one of these two is gone, you are in the once returns path. When you overcome the other, you are in the once return as fruition stage. Okay? That means the only gross part of greed and hatred will be overcome when you attain the stream entry fruition. When you overcome only one of them, you are in the uh, once, re once return is path. And the result is you are subject to birth only once more in the human realm before attaining full enlightenment. Now you have overcome five, no, no not yet, uh, three completely overcome and two you have already weakened. Then still keep on practicing Noble Eightfold Path, factors of enlightenment. Then you overcome one of them completely. The moment one of the about two weakened factor, factors becomes eradicated, you enter the non-returner path. You go to eradicate only one of them to enter the non-returner path. When you eradicate both of them, you enter the never return as fruition stage. Then result is you are subject to birth only once in the pure abodes before attaining full enlightenment. Pure abodes are five in number. There are 48 different uh, uh, individuals who, at, who have attained the uh, anagami non-returner stage. Uh, they can put into 48 different categories. We will discuss them some other time, but not today. <laughs> Don't have time for that. So now up to here, you have destroyed only five fetters and five more remain and still you go on practicing Noble Eightfold Path, uh, factors of enlightenment, uh, 
all of which include mindfulness and so forth. Then when you overcome one, two, three, four of these, if you overcome one of them you are in the Arahantut path, when you overcome two still you are in the Arahantut path, when you overcome three in Arahantut path, when you overcome four you are still in Arahantut path. Only when you overcome the last one, all the five remaining subtle fetters, you are in the Arahantut fruition stage. So, find fully enlightened, no longer subject to birth. Your suffering completely disappears. You entered full enlightenment. Now, this is the scheme you cannot skip. You cannot jump uh, from this to this, thinking, well, I do not have time to <laughs> spend <laughs> going through all of them, you know. <laughs> Let me take a you know, short course, you know, shortcut. Uh, and jump, it will never happen. And this one and the factors of enlightenment are the ones that must follow, will follow in that order. In the Noble Eightfold Path, you can practice in any order. If you have these three factors, understanding, mindfulness and effort. These are called cardinal factors to the Noble Eightfold Path. You have to have understanding and you have to have mindfulness and you have to make effort. When you practice these three, remaining five of the Noble Eightfold Path will naturally join together, come together to make the practice, the Noble Eightfold Path perfect. So, uh, that is why Buddha gave the guarantee, if you practice four foundations of mindfulness, you have uh, all the factors are here, the fetters are there and the uh, Noble Eightfold Path is there at the end of the discourse for Noble Truth and so forth, everything is in the discourse. Now friends, that is the summary of the <laughs> so four foundations of mindfulness and uh, I hope uh, uh, you study it very thoroughly, carefully, you take this hand out with you and uh, study well and keep your up with your practice. I think that is enough for some at all.